So I've been asked by the organizers to talk about accelerators for hedon therapy, and this I do very willingly, because in occasion, as uh, just Manjit said, to share my long time experience, which has advantages, of course, and also disadvantages, with all of you who are looking forward to get into this field, hopefully bringing your own personal contribution, as each one of us has to do if we want on the long term to have a field which increases for the benefit of the patients of Europe and the world, not only of the countries which have already developed this technique. I will not go in technical details because I take a, a historical approach starting from the Berkeley Times, the beginning of the story. Uh, about 80 years ago, I was at the time about 10 years old, just to tell you how old I am. Uh, in, that, okay, in that time, uh, Robert Wilson, Bob Wilson, who later became director of uh, Fermilab, and uh, you'll hear about this later on again, wrote a famous paper in which he proposed to use protons instead of X-rays to spare normal tissues, because as everybody knows, it is in all our logos, these particles having a charge lose energy in a different ways than photons in matter. And so they have, uh, while they stop, they increase uh, the, the delivery of energy because they go slower and spend more time close to the molecules and atoms of the matter. And uh, this can be used to better uh, treat uh, deep-seated tumors uh, more conformally, as we say technically. He also spoke about uh, wheels to spread this narrow black peak. The peak is narrow, to spread it, you need some method. He invented uh, at the start the method of having a rotating wheel that almost any, not very people use now, but it's very important. But most importantly, nobody knows, or very few people know, in this paper, if you read it uh, to the end, you find that also th say that the helium and calcium uh, uh, carbon ions can be used. Not explaining why, in fact, he did not know it, but he had the intuition of a great scientist. The starting uh, of all this was uh, uh, in Berkeley, as I said, because uh, uh, Bob Wilson was a student of, uh, uh, of uh, Lawrence in Berkeley, where in 1946, the 184-inch cyclone was built, and this is the building uh, during the construction. You see, this is the enormous yoke of this enormous cyclone, which later on appeared like that. Everybody knows who goes to that part of the world. And one of the figure, the essential figure was Cornelius Tobias, uh, was born in 18 and died in 2000, who uh, guided together with us, I don't go into detail because otherwise it would be too long, uh, the activities in <clears throat> Uh, uh, which started in 54, by the way, the same year in which CERN was founded, I find uh, something which I always underline, very interesting, in Berkeley, patients have been treated, in fact, women, uh, uh, pituitary glands of women who had the breast cancer, which was metastatic was not a tumor treatment, so it's a way to avoid uh, metastatic diseases. And then, the, two years later, the treatment of pituitary tumor started. At the end, about 1,000 patients had been treated in, uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, with this accelerator. This course, uh, uh, you shall hear um, uh, Dr. Blakely, who was there at the time to tell you about uh, uh, the, these times, wonderful times, which was the beginning of uh, many uh, developments, as you understand. The pioneering years. At Berkeley, there was the visit of a young uh, Swede, uh, Bowie Larson. This was uh, Bowie at the time. He's a great man, a very bright and intelligent and inventive personality who uh, came back and working at uh, the synchrocyclotron which existed at the time in Uppsala, where his own university, developed uh, this technique, this instrument, and wrote a dissertation, a thesis on the application of 185 MeV protons to experimental cancer therapy and neurosurgery. And he was the first really to 
get into this field for treating patients in a, um, say, um, systematic way. And in fact, uh, he became famous and I will mention him later during my talk. Then there were developments after Barclay, 54 and Uppsala 57 in many laboratories. The most important one was the one in, uh, by the MGH uh, uh, doctors in the, to the Harvard Cycloton Laboratory in uh, Boston, of course, plus many developments in Russia in, uh, and in China. And then uh, this and pioneering years to me ends uh, with the startup of the projects in Paul Sorrell Institute in Switzerland. Here in Switzerland, I will say, because I'm talking to you from uh, Geneva. So I will only get into some detail for Harvard and uh, Paul Scherer. I cannot go, of course, in everything uh, which uh, uh, is around. So Bob Wilson became associate professor in uh, Harvard and, uh, and designed a new 165 MeV cycloton, which was ready by 49. This is one of the first picture, 160 MeV. By the way, Norman Ramsey later on got a Nobel Prize for a different reason, but he's a great man who at the beginning of his career worked on this cycloton. And this was uh, Bob at the time, uh, as everybody in the field called him Bob, everybody called him as Bob. Uh, this is the cyclotron which has been used by the MGH uh, teams for treating uh, patients and uh, launching the field. In fact, uh, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, by, um, there were three projects, uh, three programs of the treatment of patients, neurosurgery for intracranial lesions, which is called RVMs, uh, so no tumor target, but uh, lesions, uh, eye tumors, and uh, larger tumors. And uh, the three have been very important. These are the pictures of uh, those who have been working on this. I want just to underline the importance of the contribution of Hermann Sweet and uh, Michael Goitin, uh, who guided as a physician, as a physicist, a medical physicist, uh, the group of uh, MGH and Harvard to treat uh, tumor, large tumor in particular in the brain. 2,500 patients, an enormous feat in a few years, uh, which uh, made the field development possible. Without uh, these results, which I'm showing now in the next slide, this uh, any there will be no no proton therapy and no hadron therapy in the world. This is the iconic picture of their result. As you can see, they follow up patients for many many years, which showed that uh, in the case of chondrosarcomas and chordomas, which are serious uh, brain tumors, I don't go into detail. One can get on the long term ninety eight percent and thirty percent control, much larger than the 15% control of conventional radiotherapy of the time, of the time, let me underline, because of course, conventional radiotherapy, I will come back later on this, is developing very fast because there are a lot of machines, a lot of uh, photon uh, accelerators, the electron accelerators, which produce X-rays in the world, there are a lot of many doctors, competent people who develop the technique. And so while proton therapy, which has the same effect as uh, X-rays from the point of view of radiobiology, as you shall hear later on. So there's no difference in the uh, effect on cells, uh, both tumor and normal cells, uh, as uh, than uh, X-rays. Uh, while uh, proton therapy is developing slowly because there are not enough accelerators in the world and enough people, the other field is developing fast. And so this kind of comparison are time dependent. Today, this will not be the advantage that you get. It will be much smaller. These curves will be sitting somewhere here or somewhere here. So, uh, but this was the launching um, figure, the uh, point the argument for which everybody pays the, the request of getting money in the year to follow this, uh, to develop their proton therapy accelerator. 
They go back now, I go to the uh, Paul Scherer um, development. I don't go into detail because it's a long story, as I told you, it started uh, in uh, 84 and it was, uh, it has been going since then. And I just show you a picture of the uh, complete set at the maximum of this developer, where there were three gantries called gantry one, gantry two, gantry three working, which was the uh, picture of the, the facility of PSI, which is still developing, has given a lot of contributions. Uh, the people there in particular, also by teaching as we do now, but also by working to this field. Then pass a new stage, a uh, new stage sees uh, the uh, Europe uh, getting into this uh, field in the uh, for carbon ions. So, in fact, at the time uh, we were thinking, uh, people were thinking about using oxygen, thinking that this was the optimum uh, ion as a follow up of the activity gone in Berkeley, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago. And uh, this project was called EULIMA, European uh, Ac Medical Accelerator, was led by uh, Dr. Pierre Mandrillon and uh, with the contribution of Pierre Lefebvre, an engineer, a um, great scientist in accelerators at CERN. And it was the first time that uh, CERN entered in the field. And the project uh, was based on the study of two machines, two accelerators, a synchrotron, a superconducting synchrotron, which is a synchrotron which has a high field because using superconductivity, you can go to higher field. A synchrotron, not very different from the, the cyclotron, I'm sorry, not very different, a cyclotron, not very different from the cyclotron uh, which runs at, uh, at PSI for purposes uh, which are mainly scientific and Newton physics and a, uh, a synchrotron, which was uh, designed by Lefebvre and collaborators similar to the LIA project, uh, which uh, existed uh, in, uh, in, um, in CERN, which he, he built with others. Uh, and unfortunately, well, the comparison was made. The, the committee decided that uh, for this machine, for this type of ions, oxygen, carbon, uh, it, the best machine is a synchrotron, not a superconducting cyclone, a statement which is still valid today, I must say, but then unfortunately the project will stop. And this was the time in 92 exactly in which the Terra Foundation, as I will tell you, was created. So it was a, in fact a, a starting point. The Lima was cancelled in 1992. Uh, in 1992, another very important thing happened. Uh, the first patient was treated at the Loma Linda University Medical Center, which was built because of the push of Dr. James Slater, a great man, who a doctor who had the uh, force to uh, join with Fermilab, the laboratory which was directed by uh, Bob Wilson, as I mentioned before, and uh, which designed and built a seven meter diameter synchrotron for this new facility, which was the first facility to have gantries. Gantries, which I shall not discuss today because I cannot tell everything, so I will leave to the others discussing gantries, are uh, very big structures, metal structure which support magnets, which bring the beam down to the patient and can be rotated around. There are three gantries, it was an enormous, uh, enterprise to build the center. And in fact, they've been treating patients since then. And this was another very important event which happened in 92. So much that I dare to say, and uh, because I have something to do also with this, that uh, uh, in the years 92, 94, we had the turning of this field. And uh, the events <coughs> were discussed and uh, uh, reported in all details at the 93 Como uh, First International Symposium of Helium Therapy. I got into this field in 91, and being a particle physicist, I was sure to find a lot of documentation. They found there was no documentation, not a single conference. They made a book in which what was told 
was recorded, something which would be not understood in other fields, but this was the case. And so I became friend before, when I got into the field, I visited him, uh, Bori Larson, the first man who treated patients in Europe, who was at the time professor at, uh, uh, in Zurich. And we decided to organize the first international symposium, and this volume is still valid. If you look at it, all the protagonists of the years that I told you have written something there, and all what is written there is still valid. Many things have changed, of course, but this is still valid. I'm very proud of this, which was not my merit, I must say, but because I was new to the field, but the Bori Larson who collected everybody in the world who came from China, from uh, uh, the States, from all the countries having something to say. And why then I say this was a starting point, because as I told you, Loma Linda treated the first patients. In 93, the MGH group, which had developed, as I told you, used the Harvard cycloton with such a great success, decided to launch a tendering, public tendering, to create a center in MGH. And uh, uh, the first commercial, Center. And this was the center which gave the occasion to IBA, a Belgium company, to develop its technique. And now IBA is leader of the field. Moreover, in the 93 at GSI, the pilot project I mentioned in a moment was approved for IONS. Now in Japan and in, uh, in the world of uh, radiotherapy, it was clear that carbon ions were better than oxygen. So everybody concentrated on carbon ions, which, by the way, are also easier to accelerate. And EMAC treated the first patients with carbon ions. So these were people who did the first choice. So you see, in these years, uh, there was a certain development, and there was a big uh, change of derivative. And these are uh, the starting years, the, the end of the starting years of this uh, activity. Uh, the GI uh, GSI pilot project in 97, 2008 has been very important for Europe, for the world, for Europe, and also for the collaboration we are just uh, witnessing today. Gerard Kraft has been uh, one of the people that visited and spent time in Berkeley with Tobias. And uh, Jürgen Debus at the time was a young doctor at Heidelberg University. And they, uh, together with uh, Thomas Haber, uh, who was a PhD student at the time, uh, pushed the GSI to uh, design. Uh, GSI is a great laboratory for ion physics uh, in, uh, in Darmstadt, uh, to design this, uh, um, uh, to, to use this machine, uh, which exists there, for making a beam which uh, treated patients, 500 patients with new technology as the PET, I will not go into detail, which can detect uh, the um, ions produced the carbon 11 in particular and the oxygen 16 ions produced um, oxygen 15 ions produced by the um, particles which enter the body and so one can see where the dose is really given this was a very new technology developed at the time the heavy iron medical accelerator SIBA, which is now called the QST Hospital of the Institute for Quantum Skull Science and Technologies in Japan, was created by Professor Irao. And unfortunately for them, the medical director was a great man. He is a great man, a friend of Europe of Manjit, of our projects, the Professor Tsuji, who has guided a group of very competent people, technically and medically, and so much that by now they have the largest contingent of treated patients, 50,000 patients in the year 94, 2021. And they have been opening the way to all the developments in uh, uh, ion therapy, particularly on carbon therapy. In fact, in fact, when we started, uh, we started, I mean, Kraft uh, in GSI and myself at CERN, the basic was, see, yes, Berkeley, but Berkeley had treated patients only with nail, but then the basis and the first source of information were coming from this center, which is a very big center. 
In fact, uh, these big synchrotrons have been designed for med not for medical physics, uh, but for treatment of patients, but initially for nuclear physics, so they are much larger than what is needed. They are a radius of 40 meters and is not necessary. In fact, I can uh, just uh, remind you, and this will be only my uh, slide, the only slide on accelerators. I remind you, because I'm sure that most of you know it, uh, that um, uh, for treating patients with protons, one uses cyclotrons typically. In fact, uh, for instance, the Harvard cyclotron, which have four, five meter diameter. Uh, this is a sketch of a normal temperature cyclotron, which was at the time Wilson, as I will show in a moment, uh, nowadays cyclotron, or even better, synchrocyclotrons, I will distinguish them in a moment, uh, they used for, mostly used for protons, but there are also facilities, and they will show some of them, in which uh, synchrotrons are used. You know, they are much lighter, the um, uh, magnets are uh, on the uh, circle and the particles are accelerated following uh, the circle, while instead in the cyclotron they follow a spiral way. And this for getting the 250 mV protons, which are needed to get uh, to about 32 centimeter in water, um, one needs uh, diameters with a normal temperature cyclotron of six, nine meters, according to the design. Just because I'm talking uh, about uh, machines, I also mentioned that when you go to carbon ions, for which you need about uh, 4,800, 5,000 uh, uh, mEV, 4,800, which corresponds to 400 mV per nucleon, each one of the nucleons of the 12 nucleons in the carbon has to carry about 400, 430 mV. This needs much larger uh, accelerators typically synchrotons, uh, I uh, will mention also cyclotons, but uh, these are mainly synchrotons because as Elunima proved, as I told you, the committee set out and compared, if uh, it's easier to reach these energies with synchrotons, much easier than with uh, cyclotron, even if they are superconducting. Uh, at the beginning, uh, when uh, the field started to develop, Multi-room facilities were built, and IBA, because of the order of Harvard and the MGH, as I told you, was became easily market leading, and this was their uh, standard uh, cyclotron, which is small, relatively small, but it's a, quite a big machine. As you see it here. Yeah, this is the place. Of course, you see, a cycle is big, but it's nothing as uh, respect to the dimensions of the center because gantries are much bigger than the cycle. Close parenthesis. This is room temperature cyclotron, and uh, the, the typical offer of uh, uh, even at the time was a center with all the diagnostics, three gantries, and uh, another room for treatment for a cost which was of the order at that time. Uh, money of the time of, let's say, 100, uh, 120 uh, million euros. This was a multi-room facility, and uh, this is the gantry, uh, the room at the end of the gantry. You see this is the, uh, the end of the beam. The beam uh, comes out here, and this can be rotated around so that uh, the doctor can choose the right uh, um, direction. This was very large, but uh, unfortunately, fortunately, uh, development came out uh, which uh, uh, changed the, uh, really the field and helped a lot the development of this uh, uh, radiotherapy in various hospitals. And this is the development of a single room facility. And a lot of groups have un had understood that more or less at the same time uh, that uh, if you try to sell to hospital a center which is so expensive for so many patients, you have two inconvenience. First, that the hospital do not buy because it's too expensive. Secondly, that since you have a lot of possibility of a patient throughput, you have to collect patients from a big area. And this is inconvenient for the people. It's much better to sell smaller machine with a single, uh, single home facility, as we call them now, which would be 
placed in more hospitals for the same amount of money and let people not to travel too much. In fact, this has been a boom. And uh, the smallest one of this machine, I just now uh, passed to some of uh, my, uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, slides, is the one built by Mavion. This is a superconducting cyclotron, which has a very high field, nine Tesla, built by, designed by an MIT group, uh, which is very competent in high field magnets. This is the design. And it is mounted on a gantry. You see, this is the cyclotron, which rotates, but does not rotate as previously around by 360 degrees, but only half a circle, let me put it, so that there is a lot of room for access for the patient, for the doctors, and so on. This is a solution which I find very good. Some doctors do not like it, but I'm completely of the opposite opinion. I think it is true that one has then to rotate the patient, but mechanically, today, the system we have are so precise that there is no problem with the patient rotation, and this patient rotation is low, which doesn't perturb the patient, and is simplifying a lot and giving a lot of space. This uh, now most of the accelerators, most not all of them have this kind, which was also was introduced by, by the way, at PSI as many other good ideas. This is the Mavion. Then I show you what has been done by ABA, of course. Now, instead of having a cyclotron, they have a synchrocyclotron as a Mavion, uh, which is called SC, S2C2. They have a very compact gantry. And this is the facility, which you see is much smaller than uh, uh, the facility which was offered before and which has been sold and very well. And this is one of the reasons for which the field has been developing a lot. Uh, and the room, of course, uh, has more space because also in this case, the rotation is only about 100. And uh, this is one of the first uh, center in which this was mounted. Now there are maybe 20, 25 of these accelerators in, uh, in the world. And uh, they are still going on. Uh, the solution by Sumitomo in Japan is very intelligent because it's on two floors. And so it has a very small uh, layout because it developed vertically in the own hospital, the, lay, uh, the, the floor, uh, the footprint is very costly. And they have also a very special gantry, which is called Cochfield gantry, which I don't want to discuss. The, the, the other, the next one is uh, the um, solution by Varian pro beam. This is a, also a, is a cyclotron, not a modern super uh, cyclotron, is more, uh, old style cyclotron, which has advantages as I will show you before, and it has a very large gantry. So the system is a bit bigger, but still they sold many. And this is the solution of Itasha. We'll come back because at now we have bought one of this is also a synchrotron, as you can see, four magnet synchrotron. This is the Linux, and this is a single room facility, which uh, requires uh, uh, not too much space. And there's one advantage with respect to all the other solutions that the field, the radiating field is very large, 30 by 40 centimeter. This is one of the reasons for which we have chosen it in uh, uh, now. Eventually, there is a single room facility by Proton, a company, American company, which has built in MGH using two standard vaults for photon radiotherapy, which are the vaults which are used standard for photon radiotherapy and which comes out uh, uh, to be uh, very compact. Uh, synchrotron, this electronics, and on the other side there is a gantry and you see the room. Now, what are the challenges of photon radiotherapy? Well, the first one, which I tried to discuss until now, uh, challenge A, was uh, compactness. Compactness, and this has been answered, uh, this uh, push toward compactness by introducing superconductivity, superconducting cycles, and in particular, synchrocycles, as I just showed you. The second challenge is flash radiotherapy. I cannot go into detail. This is a technique which has been developed with photons recently, which is based on the observation that if you have tumors irradiated with photons, X-rays, as they call the medical doctors, so produced by standard Linux for radiotherapy. They, uh, if you give the dose in 100 or 1,000th of the time, uh, let's say typically 200 milliseconds, the same dose, few rays, instead of the 200 seconds uh, of uh, 
I speak now about, about proton therapy, not X-rays in the case of uh, X-rays is less. But anyway, if you reduce, increase by factor more than 100, possibly 1000, the dose rate, the tumor cells get killed because they are still sensitive, even more sensitive to the radiation and the normal cells, the healthy cells surrounding it, traversed by the X-rays, survive much better. They have a much better survival rate. This is very important because this would be a very good, if brought to the clinical practice, would develop a lot uh, X-ray treatments and would be a big challenge to proton therapy. So the challenge to now to proton therapy is to develop the same technique, but with protons. And uh, to do that, of course, uh, one has to distinguish the kind of machines because in the case of cyclotrons, uh, the beam is always present. So there is always beam coming out. But of course, on the beam, there is the structure of the radio frequency because it is accelerated only when the field is maximum. So there is a structure, but the beam is always present. The current is very high. In synchrocyclotron instead, as you may know, I hope you know, a synchrocyclotron is a cyclotron in which uh, not only uh, the field is the magnetic field is fixed, but uh, the radio frequency changes with time so that uh, one can guide and accelerate the particles with increasing energy. And then at the end, it is extracted. So the beam is pulsed at uh, 1000 Hertz every 0.1 millisecond. And the, on top, there is the mega structure. In the synchrotrons, uh, uh, instead, the beam is pulsed with a, a raising field, then there is the extraction, then the field goes down over the magnets, then there is the acceleration cycle. So there are times where there is no beam at all, and there are pulses which are about one second or uh, two, three seconds long. And this is so a pulse beam of, of two, five seconds, at this rate with or without RF structure, depends upon how you extract the beam. But there is no beam for about one second. Eventually, instead, the LINAC, which I will mention at the end, is one of the activity of the Terra Foundation, uh, have uh, four pulsed beam. So there are particles, protons, in particular, for a few microseconds and nothing for milliseconds. Few microseconds and nothing for milliseconds. So you see, the beam structure is very different. I don't want to, you know, to get more than this feeling. The machines are giving same energies, but a very different time structure. And this makes a difference when you look at the, what can be done for increasing the intensity. And just to say a few words of the big challenges that accelerator physics have at this moment is that in the case of cyclone, it's easy to increase the current as needed for making a flash uh, radiotherapy with protons or even with carbon ions. In, in the case of synchrocyclone, the difficulty is medium. It's not impossible, but it's difficult because the beam is pulsed, so there is a lot of time when there is no beam. In the case of synchrotron, it's very difficult to get uh, um, uh, by intensity by factor 1000 higher than what we have today. Very difficult. And usually, I'm sure, by Elena Benedetto and Marius Sapinski later on, what is being done at the present on superconducting uh, synchrotrons. And then, instead, in the uh, case of the uh, linear accelerator, the structure is such that uh, you can, if you have a good source, the difficulty is medium. So this challenge is one of the challenges that you people who are getting into this field will have to tackle in the next year to just prove that protons, and which is difficult, and certainly carbon ions are beating also in this field the way in which uh, uh, people treat patients uh, with uh, uh, photons. Now, I, Joe, uh, I'm not sure, Manjit, that I checked uh, when I started. I'm very sorry. Can I ask you how much time I still have? So I... Hugo, please, it's fine, because I finished quite early, so you have, take your time. No problem. No problem. So I go, I'm going to the li right space. What do you think? Too fast? Too slow? No, it's fine. I think it's great. Thank you. So uh, now I go so slowly, since I'm invited to do so to the status of light ion therapy centers in Japan and Europe. I don't speak about other regions because it would be too much. As you will see at the end, I will cover an enormous 
field, but this is just an introduction. You shall hear a lot more about everything in detail. So the most important thing, uh, the message to pass is that Japan has been the leading force in this, uh, the Japan scientists in particular, starting from the head of all this, uh, Professor uh, Tsushi uh, in the, at the uh, Institute for Sciences and Technologies in Chiba, the leader, six carbon ion facilities, these are mentioned here. And here I show one of the, uh, first, uh, which is called, uh, has been built at Guna University. Why I show it? Because this was just the coming out of the experience of the Chiba uh, accelerator and uh, medical uh, development. And uh, in strict con uh, connection with uh, Mitsubishi, because in Japan, they have a different attitude towards the accelerator development than in Europe and in the States they work very closely with industry, which means that their centers cost much more if you look to the cost they spend, but they are made in a different way because the, the scientists have only to say what they want. And then there are a lot of engineers coming from companies on site will follow up the work and have uh, also uh, possibility of continuing to develop the technique. So in Guna, as you can see, there is a synchrotron. You see this uh, synchrotron. At the center, uh, there is the electronics. And then there are these rooms. And you see here, horizontal beam, vertical beam, vertical beam. This is a standard. What uh, uh, in Japan is called third and fourth generation development, because uh, uh, there is also Gantry addition, which I will not mention, as I said. Uh, these strict collaborations with companies, Mitsubishi, Itachi, Toshiba, and also many others, or smaller companies, has been one of the uh, reasons, I'm sure, for which uh, uh, Professor Tsuji managed to uh, develop so much this field, because companies have been very pushy with the governments to, and uh, with their uh, uh, shareholders to get money to build this facility. And uh, this technology can push has lacked almost completely, in fact, in some cases failed, unfortunately, in Europe and also in the States. This is something to say, the structure of the society may be getting into this kind of, of uh, different uh, behavior of people and also of the technological development. This is Gunnar University construction. And uh, going now to Europe, the first facility, which was built uh, as a follow-up of course, of the pilot project uh, started by Gerhard Kraft, uh, Jürgen de Busch, is the HIT uh, center in uh, Heidelberg. Uh, you see, uh, I wrote uh, the medical director is Jürgen de Busch, always, now big professor and famous professor of radiotherapy, radio oncology in Germany. At that time, at the beginning, he was a PhD. He, by the way, he has a double PhD in physics and uh, medicine. This is very relevant. and. Thomas Haber, a very uh, great man, technical director. And in this machine, there is a synchrotron, of course, as I mentioned, and there are three horizontal beams and uh, which uh, the rooms have been built by Siemens. And the project of the accelerators and all this has been done by the GSI group, of course, um, which started it. And then there is the first ion gant, an enormous, uh, uh, ion gantry, which is very heavy and uh, has been the and has been making this center different from the other center we'll mention in a moment because they can rotate the beam around the patients now everybody is working on this as you know passing uh, using superconducting magnets but this you shall hear more not by me in the next days this is the first european center and then there is another center in germany which is uh, uh, was built by Siemens Medical. This company tried to follow uh, the path of the Japanese comedy, but uh, did not uh, succeed in getting enough center approved. The cost was high and they had to interrupt the construction after a couple of centers. And this center is a wonderful center. You see a machine has been designed a different one, a synchrotron, and there are beams, so horizontal and inclined beam here, and there are four rooms. You shall hear by Killian Bowman in this course, this uh, description, more detailed description of this facility. Okay. Then comes CERN. Uh, in 91, I decided to leave my 30 year activity in 
fundamental physics, uh, basic physics in, uh, at CERN. I was leading a big project uh, called Delphi at the Leopard Collider and uh, decided to do the change and uh, spend my last uh, activity. I could not know that was another 30 years long, I must say, by the time, but this is the case in the field of which I've been working on in my institute in Rome, the National Institute. Uh, physics laboratory where I had been working for 10 years before coming to CERN in 73, uh, where I learned about radiation physics and about uh, radiation, of course, with X-rays. And uh, to go back and uh, push an activity which CERN could do, which is building a facility for carbon ions. Same idea, but different reason, came to a friend of mine, the leader of the Austrian group in Delphi, uh, Professor Regler, uh, who had pushed the project at the time was called Austron for a building a, a machine for a spallation source in Austria. We joined forces with Phil Bryan, the very known uh, phys uh, machine physicist at CERN, and we pushed, convinced, after a lot of uh, difficulties, CERN in '95 to start PIMS, a proton ion medical machine study. I must say, uh, I'm one of the things of which I'm most proud in my professional life is that to manage to get this to was not easy because the director general of the time did not like it, but some members of the directorate liked because CERN had never done medical application and people would say, why do you start this? Other laboratories can do it. There are so many uh, national labs. Why should we do it? I think I, on the long term, it is essential the CERN is in because the uh, collaborative spirit that you see also in this course, which has been uh, born with CERN and now is ob obvious, but was not obvious at the beginning, is fundamental to get this kind of activities uh, productive and uh, realizing something and coming to a conclusion. And this group, in with which uh, Sandro Rossi, which you also mentioned, was leading the CERN contingency of five people, spent three years at CERN, designed under the leadership of Phil Bryant, this uh, uh, kind of layout, which is a synchrotron, very special synchrotron with a lot of good characteristics, which uh, accelerates the carbon ions, protons, and helium, whatever, and many gantries of different types that I will not discuss. And by the way, the most important thing is that nobody thought at that time one should build a accelerator and a layout like this. Of course, you see, oh, with all this gantry, proton gantry, ion gantry, uh, this is the uh, so-called uh, Rizangat gantry, was just to be taken as a toolkit from which each group who wanted to build in Europe, also elsewhere, with such a machine, could you take it, uh, information, and then modified to what was considered to be the best solution for that group. And it is, in fact, what people did it. And out of this, I don't go much more in detail because uh, they will hear more. Uh, two group, uh, two uh, proposals came out. CNAO, our proposal, this was Terra Foundation design in uh, when the, uh, Sandro Rossi was the technical director of Terra. And uh, Medostron, as uh, you know, uh, for Medostron, you shall see uh, here a talk by Dr. Schreiner. And uh, for now, you shall hear it in very talks. Uh, this is the figure, which is interesting because uh, has been made by Thomas Aberer for comparing the dimension of the layout uh, of different facilities. These are the two coming out from Pimsk now first and a few years later, Medostron. And these are instead the first facility I showed you for protons, not for carbon ions, there with uh, three rooms by ERBA. And this is the uh, HIT facility. As you can see, uh, we talk about uh, uh, area in this case for now, not very different from the facility here, but here there are four gantries and here there are only fixed beams. So uh, when you go to carbon ion, automatically you get much bigger dimension, and this is one of the difficulties of uh, carbon ions also, challenges to reduce the dimension. Uh, I wrote the story of particle accelerator in a book, and you allow me a small advertisement. This is the book uh, in which I speak not only about accelerators for medical physics, but in fact, the main issue, the main uh, path is accelerators for 
fundamental physics, basic research in particles and the forces, in the fundamental forces. So I call it from Big Bang physics to add on therapy because what we do at CERN, these particle accelerators in the other big laboratories who do basic research is to study what happened in very high energy collision. As you know, this high energy collision happened in the first microsecond of the time uh, after the Big Bang. And so the accelerators are just the tools which allow us to go back in time and study the beginning of the uh, history of our universe. And at the same time, using the beams, much lower energy, much smaller ones. As you can see here, this is the IBA gantry that I showed you before, uh, uh, help uh, physician to treat patients which have difficult cancer uh, and uh, cure them and save their lives. So particle accelerators, a double purpose, and in fact, the light motif of this book is physics is beautiful and useful, and this is something that I would like you to carry over after my talk. Think always like that. Accelerators develop for studying uh, physics without uh, of fundamental physics without any aim. Eventually, found an application in uh, particle therapy, and this is always the case applications of basic research follow without people wanting, once you do understand better the world, you develop tools for better understanding the world, somebody will find a great man as Bob Wilson, a way to use it for the good uh, of humanity, in particular to cure patients. What are the current ch challenges of light ion therapy? The same as the one of uh, uh, with uh, with protons compactness flash radiotherapy and a new one which is multi-ion treatments it is compactness means to try to reduce the dimension i showed you the very big we should reduce the dimensions and this is uh, the overall it's not easy because uh, uh, one can gain factor of two or three but uh, not order of magnitudes way anyway is to go as has been done for proton machines to superconducting magnets both for the accelerators as also for the gantries the second is flash radiotherapy as i told you and i will not mention any longer this is difficult because as i told you the best accelerators for ion therapy are synchrotrons but synchrotrons are very difficult to charge with a lot of particles and so extract a lot of particles in a short time to do flash therapy with ions is difficult. Of course, there is not much experience still with flash ion radiotherapy, maybe it's not useful, but the indication we have, which is quite a lot, says that also for ions, carbon ions or other ions, for instance, the helium ions, flash radiotherapy is important. So this development will be discussed I'm pretty sure in the next talks is very uh, interesting. Multi-ion treatment means that you want to treat the same tumors with different ions in short times. Is a problem, but it's not such a challenge as the other two. So let me go now to uh, the other challenges. And I want to tell you that uh, as usual, this field is led by the Japanese. They have a quantum scalpel project at this uh, uh, Institute for Quantum Science and Technologies in Chiba, who owns and have done it so much, which has uh, this machine, NEOS in 94, as I told you, which has an enormous area. And they have a line of development, which is called the, Scam the Quantum Scalpel Project, which is made by these steps. They consider, maybe a bit a posteriori, the Gunnar University accelerator, which I showed you before, as a second and third generation uh, development. And uh, as you can see, this is uh, quite small. It's one third than this. But this was built too big because, as I told you, the accelerators are not built for particle uh, therapy, but we are built for nuclear physics purpose. So this gain is uh, a bit uh, fake. Let me put it again. But, but then, then studying, they are working on the fourth generation, they are studying a fifth generation. As you can see, this is Gunnar. This will be the dimensions with a single room facility, single room facility for carbon ions. I will show it better in a moment. 
which uh, is one twentieth of this. And the fifth generation, I will show you a little more detail, is smaller and smaller. It is one fortieth of this. So uh, they can say that really in the, uh, this, by the end of this decade, by the thirties, they would have done quite a lot. This is the quantum scalper project for the generator IV ions. You see there is a five Tesla synchrotron, uh, which has a 10 meter diameter, the LINAC for injection, LINAC, standard LINAC, and then a very compact gantry. This is a compact gantry, a gantry which has a field of five Tesla. You know, standard magnets uh, for synchrotrons or normal temperature has a field of 1.5 Tesla. And of course, if you increase the field, the momentum, that is uh, not exactly the energy, but the momentum of the particle will decrease, and five Tesla is enormous. Uh, field, but uh, achievable. They built this uh, prototype magnet. In fact, they are constructing this so that you can get a gantry which is not larger than a gantry for protons. The gantry of uh, uh, Loma Linda, the first gantry of 92, had a similar diameter, five meters uh, radius. So uh, this is really a fourth generation, very, is ongoing, a project which is ongoing. This will be then possibly, uh, of course, in collaboration with the industry will go around the world. And then this is the ongoing project, uh, multi-ion system, so that I've introduced here the possibility of changing very rapidly the ions, which I mentioned before. And then there will be the fifth generation. And this fifth generation, which is even smaller, as I showed you, has a superconducting magnets, but the injection is not done with the LINAC, but with a uh, with laser. There are new laser possibilities, very powerful lasers, which can produce ions, carbon ions, other ions. It's a very advanced project, but this will be more compact and produce more current. And also, of course, multi-ion radiation. So this is the most coherent uh, program in the world, and certainly with the help of industry, we'll bring a lot of uh, uh, to to the world because people will buy. There is in Europe a project by IBA, who is an expert, as I told, showed you to you in cyclotron, synchrocyclotron, who want to apply the concept of synchrocyclotron also for carbon ions. Unfortunately, as proven by Ulima, the magnets for a synchrocyclotron are very big. Of course, a lot has been changed. People have learned a lot since the design of Lima. So this is not as big as the Lima one, it's only 700 tons, but it's a very big uh, piece of iron. And uh, Iba is such a competent in this field that uh, is designing, not only designing, but building it slowly, but uh, firmly for a project which is called Arcad, Arcad or Arcad project in Cannes. So this will be a first, superconducting uh, carbon ion. And then there is the development, which we shall see more in a moment, uh, uh, which is the, the work which is going in NIMS and uh, Maurizio Vetter. NIMS uh, is the new uh, the follow up, so the new ion medical machine study following up PIMS after so many years, which is at the center of many new developments, in particular uh, the CIST project, uh, the project for a center in Southeastern Europe which uh, has been mentioned, I think, by Manjit, in which I've also been working a lot. And in this course, in a moment, you shall hear it by Elena Benedetto and Marius Sapinski. These are two layouts, just to show you a picture that, uh, uh, that will be shown to you and discussed with you of synchrotons, superconducting synchrotons. Terra also designed some of them, but uh, this will not be, uh, will be discussed much better. Now I conclude, uh, Manjit, I'm sorry, probably it was a bit too long. How much have been spoken? Uh, that's okay, if, uh, five more minutes, if that's okay with you. See, si. I want to just indulge in uh, uh, some memory and uh, speak about Terra. You know, uh, as uh, you know, Terra has been the foundation who has been done pushing mainly the CNAO project, in fact, designing it, as I told you, but we've done other things. And uh, since uh, we were born in Novara exactly 30 years ago, and uh, since uh, we will have a symposium for the 30 years of Terra in the CERN Council Chamber, exactly on the day 
15th September of this year, I thought that I could end by telling you what, looking back, we have done as uh, main projects. We have done many projects. And uh, I want to speak about three of these uh, offsprings or sons or whatever uh, of uh, Terra in these 30 years. The first one is layout of Knau. This uh, is the layout of Knau, as I showed you, is quite compact because with Sandro, we decided to split the beam in three and make it compact using the synchrotron, of course, of PIMS, but not using, as Medost has done, the very bright and powerful lines, but very long lines uh, for, to the rooms uh, by, uh, which were in the PIMS study. This was uh, by the Terra Foundation and was passed to Knau in 2003, and the same day, Sandro Rossi was Terra Technical Director, became Knau Technical Director, with all with 25 people, uh, 16 uh, employees plus uh, uh, experts. And uh, this group is the was made a core group of Knau still now. Sandro Puglia, um, Marco Puglia is one of them. Just uh, somebody we shall hear talking here about Knau. Uh, with uh, this virtual physics, a very nice project. This is the layout uh, of now. And now, recently, we have uh, approved, I mean, in the board of now, we have approved two new developments. When we built now, we, on purpose, left uh, two big areas around to further develop it. And uh, the, in one of this area, I will show you better in a moment, there will be, the, we are building, the, the building is being uh, worked on today, uh, two facilities. We will add a proton therapy hall with an Itachi synchrotron that you showed before, and this is the Itachi synchrotron at the gantry, and uh, another uh, high current uh, fan de Graaf by a company, American company, who wants to test and validate the technique of Bohr neutron capture therapy, which I cannot go into detail, with two holes to treat. So you see, there will be three treatment uh, rooms added, two for neutrons and one for protons. And uh, with this, I'm very happy to say, the name Knau, National Center for Oncological Hadron Therapy, becomes two because we shall have on site carbon ions, helium ions, other ions, protons, which we have already, plus neutrons for treating patients. And uh, in the general layout, you see this will be the, uh, how it will be appear. These are the three existing rooms for carbon. This will be the room for uh, here, for uh, protons I mean, with uh, gantry, with treating gantry. And these are the rooms for, uh, uh, B and City. As I mentioned already, uh, the reason for choosing Itachi, one of the reasons was that the field is very large. But we have left another space here, and this is the space for the future superconducting gant. So much that Canal has made an agreement with uh, ENFN, with uh, CERN, and with Medoston, and, uh, and of course NIMS, and there is a study going on on the future superconducting gant to which Terra has also contributed, but I don't want to go into details. Another activity we have done is the development of a new type of accelerator. This is the development of a linear accelerator. You know, electrons are accelerated by linear accelerators for treating patients with photons. And the question whether one could do it with uh, uh, the same frequency, three gigahertz, uh, with uh, photons was well, well obvious. And we managed to build the first prototype, which, by the way, is today in the CERN microcosmos, which accelerated. Uh, protons from 62 MeV to 74 MeV after a beam coming out from the Catania uh, superconducting cyclotron, a, a cyclotron. So this was the first cyclinic, a concept that also developed a cyclotron which injects in a linac. This was very successful. And then uh, a company was built, uh, founded, which was called Adam. And uh, in, the CERN, in the CERN bunker, uh, Adam, which was bought by the... Uh, British company Evo in 2013 has tested, as you shall hear uh, by uh, shortly uh, on Friday, if I'm right. And this is the accelerators. And by now, uh, this company uh, it has accelerated uh, protons to 52 MeV on 16 meters. And uh, this is the 
uh, light ion therapy uh, accelerator with its characteristic, which is being built at present in the raspberry. And uh, at this course, uh, Alberto De Giovanni, who is also a PhD, vice PhD student working with Sarah, we speak about Adam and light. So this is the second of spring. Now, Adam, but there is a third one, which I'm uh, quite uh, curious to know whether this will be, and I hope so, will be a useful one. You see, Ebamed has been created as a, a startup company, which I'm the co founder, to develop a cardio kit to enable non invasive heart motion ultrasound imaging. So it's based on ultrasound to know where the heart is so that the heart can be in real time uh, hit in the right place to treat uh, arrhythmia, arrhythmias, cardiac arrhythmias that nowadays are treated with catheters in the veins. It's a very invasive process. This is non-invasive, should be very short. And this is a, a system which has been used for the first time in Knau. The first patient in the world treated with protons in this way was in Knau a couple of years ago. And uh, now uh, we are developing in this field. And Adriano Garona, who was technical director there, is now the <coughs> Uh, see, te chief technical uh, officer of this small company, Ebamed, which hopes in 2024, as he will tell you, to bring this technique also to uh, the patients. Conclusions. Physics is beautiful and useful. Accelerators, as uh, I mentioned, can be used both for studying physics and for uh, studying uh, treating patients. And even not only tumor patients, also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, AVMs, which are lesions, but also, uh, I hope in the long term, uh, even uh, this kind of arrhythmias, which uh, have a very deadly disease of many uh, in the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Go. What a wonderful talk to really Take us, take us from the back and walk us through to the future. So that's exactly what we needed to start this course off. So now uh, I pass it over to our students for questions. So please, don't hesitate. You can either put it in chat, put your, raise your hand or, okay. So I, I, okay, I will, Andreas, please ask your question, Andreas. I think you're muted at the moment, Andreas. We can't, we can't hear you, Andreas. So perhaps while you fix your microphone, we can ask Florian. Yes, Florian, can you hear me? Please? Yes, we can, yes, please. Okay, perfect, yeah. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. It was really a great overview. I would have a question about this um, boron neutron capture therapy because I never heard of that before. Can you maybe just quickly explain the principles how that kind of therapy works? First, let me say that is an experimental technique. Mm -hmm. This is just a test. You see, Knau is a research institute, as all of you know very well. All these are research institutes. So it's a technology which has been used for many patients with some success in Japan in particular, but it's not something which is a technique for treating patients. And so this company, which I will not name, an American company, wants to develop the new uh, tool. They have a very nice accelerators for doing a very high current, uh, few MeV, couple of MeV protons, which hit a target, produce neutrons, epithermal neutron. And this neutron beam is, for instance, sent to the brain of a, a patient which has, who has a glioblastoma, typically, and which had been injected before with a substance which contains boron. And boron is something which eats easily neutrons and breaks and produce ions, uh, alpha particles and others, which uh, are very short range, few, hundred, uh, few tens of microns, and very heavily ionizing. They are much more ionizing than the carbon ions. And so the idea is that if you manage, which is possible to get a density of boron, which is at least 10 times, possibly 100 times more higher in the uh, tumor cells because of the selection of the carrier 
of the bone than in healthy tissues with a beam of neutrons, which is wide and goes everywhere. You cannot just, there is no black peak in the case of neutrons. You can still have an effect and kill these cells. This is typically target is the glioblastoma, which is very deadly uh, cancer. Is developed, uh, there are thousands of papers on this, conferences, but still is in his infancy. And honestly speaking, <clears throat> I'm not sure it will work really for the patients, but at now it is just an opening towards uh, a research which is certainly of interest and uh, in which we can give a contribution because uh, there are all the expertise to check whether this works and then also to get uh, the eventually the CE mark for the facility if uh, they think it uh, are positive. Does this answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. So I'm leaving it over to our students to take field the questions. So Krista, please. Okay, uh, Andreas, are you okay with the mic now? <laughs> Uh, do you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So thanks for, uh, for this interesting talk and introduction. I, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, flash therapy. I just have a quick, or could you talk about a little bit more about synchrotrons, especially what the exact challenges are? Is this more uh, limitations of the machine itself, so the magnets and everything, or how much do the, the limitations of, for example, the beam monitoring at these very fast timescales or the, the symmetry uh, play into this. Let me say that I would be happy if the only problem was monitoring this high density, which is a problem. The problem is to put it in. You see, there is a Liouville theorem, probably you know, which tells you that you cannot charge inside a certain phase space, which is available, let's say, in the synchrotron, too many particles. And this is what limits the number of protons or carbon ions, whatever you can put inside the ring. And so the uh, filling, as we say, of the synchrotron is a very delicate process. There are ways of playing with uh, the, uh, this, for instance, I mean, just to go back to history, since we are talking on two planes, I mean, both fundamental physics and uh, radiotherapy, um, Van der Meer got his Nobel, his Nobel Prize with Carlo Rubio because he had invented a technique to beat the Liouville theorem when you put antiprotons in a ring, just to tell you. So well, this was worth a while, a Nobel Prize, the, the, the invention of a method to beat the Liouville theorem, but it's not easy. Uh, in fact, uh, you can cool the beams, but it's so expensive and so on. And so the challenge is that uh, one has first a limitation on the uh, density, let put like that, of the circulating carbon ions, so the number of carbon ions you can put in a ring. But second also that uh, typically, as uh, I mentioned, um, in a synchrotron, since uh, you have the accelerating cycle, then the extraction, the accelerating cycle, and so on, you give the dose on many cycles, and these cycles are lasting few seconds. And so you cannot do it in one millisecond, in 100 milliseconds. The only way is that you put all the carbon ions that you need for the treatment inside the, link, uh, the ring, and then you extract them in a very short process, so, which cannot be too short. So it is a very complex uh, thing, uh, which is to build, uh, to beat uh, the Liouville stream, to put with a very high density uh, of a charge in uh, the Linux itself. Of course, if you increase the, in a certain uh, emittance uh, volume in the phase space, you increase the density of production of carbon in ions that you inject, then you can get higher intensity, but that's difficult to put them many times. And also it can uh, beat the fact that uh, you have to not have many cycles, but a single cycle. These are the two difficulties, but uh, there are solutions. Elena Benedict, I'm sure will mention this. Um, uh, we think we think that this is feasible for the next generation. This is much more difficult than, for instance, multi-ion uh, People speak a lot about multi-ion treatment, but uh, the technical difficulties to get a multi-ion treatment is nothing to do with the difficult to get uh, uh, 
carbon ions uh, used in a flash therapy mode. Does this answer your question? Yes, uh, thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Uh, yeah, please. Question? Um, please, go, so, yeah, sorry, so, sorry, Andreas, please. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, if we have time, yes, but let the other two okay. people ask their questions first. Okay, sorry. Christophs, please. Okay, so next was Adam. Hi, uh, thanks for Hi. a really interesting uh, historical overview for all of this broad subject. Um, historically, uh, sometimes this field has been driven by the advancements uh, on the accelerator side, uh, whereas other times it's been driven more by the medical requirements. Uh, in your experience, which of those has been more common and which one has led to the greatest changes or developments in this area? Well, um, <laughs> let me say, say, look to the people. You see, ideas work on the feet of the people, don't by themselves. So. Professor Tsuji, who is fundamental to this field, is a medical doctor who has a great experience in medical physics. So certainly he has done a big contribution, but he was helped by a lot of technical people around him. On the other side, if I may say, Gerhard Kraft and myself, who pushed the, the project in Germany, in Italy, and in, in Europe, let's say together, with all the light and all the rest, we are physicists. Gerard is a radiobiologist formed at the school of Berkeley, Tobias. I am a physicist who comes out from fundamental physics. So uh, I don't want to say three examples. I say three cases, if I can say, show that it uh, depends only about uh, the fact that there is somebody who wants really to do something in spite of all the difficulties. That's uh, my answer. Uh, may I? Just add something, Christophs, to the question to Adam, and then you can go to the next one. I, I, you know, Ugo has just talked about three examples. I think the passion, the, the common theme is the passion and commitment and making sure things happen. I think that's the one thing. It doesn't matter whether you're a doctor, biologist, or physicist. Sorry, just had to say that. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we can move on to the next question from Kyungdon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Amardi. Uh, I really appreciate your talk and it was really helpful for your overview paper when I was writing my thesis. Uh, my question is that Knau seems to be very successful not only for carbon ion therapy, but also for the expansions of their project. And like Asian countries are lack of the land and they are having difficulties in expanding their facilities. So my question is that, what is the best way to have this spare space for the future expansion when they are designing the facility? I didn't quite answer, I get to answer the question. You, said, you asked me, how can you get more land around your plant? Well, I mean- I mean, like some countries are having limited space and they sometimes cannot have the spare space. And what is the optimal choice of having the spare space when they are designing the facilities? Well, I think it's a choice of the site. I mean, you see, you have been looking forward what we did with now, we looked forward. So we got a site which is much bigger, but of course we have been lucky because this site if you look at my last picture, you see this picture is taken from the floor of the hospital, the Pavia hospital, university hospital, which just close by, you see. So we found such a big area, which is on the outskirts of Pavia, which is a university town, small university town, and uh, where there was space, uh, there was quite a lot of land, a piece of land, uh, and uh, close to an hospital. This is not an easy solution. It was a lucky coincidence. Let me put it like that. If I, you know, in life you have to work hard, but also you have to be lucky. Otherwise, you don't go very far. And this was a very lucky coincidence. We would have built it. Also. For instance, let's take HIT. HIT has been built at the center of the KFZ, the big institute. You can work underground from the uh, X-ray holes for treatment to the place where people are treated with carbon ions, which is wonderful, which we cannot do. 
but on the other side, they have difficulty in developing new things. If they wanted to add a new superconducting uh, gantry, they should dismount the present one and make a new one. So uh, I have not a recipe to tell you how to choose the land, but you think about if you have a certain moment of your life to decide to build something, think about the long-term development of the uh, project. That's the only advice I can give. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, not, uh, was not a good answer, but uh, I understand it, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> uh, that was really helpful. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Ugo, if I may, I think it, there is no easy answer. Lots of people want to build it in the hospital and lots of people then say, ah, oh, we don't have the hospital facilities. So it's always a compromise, right? Yes, and, right. and luck. So this is what happens. Sorry, Christoph, please. If we can, I guess, steal one or two minutes from the coffee yes, break. Yes, please then do. The second well, it's up question. to you. Ask the students. <laughs> yes, I guess there was the second question from Andreas. Uh, yes, this was just a short question. So did I understand it correctly that for flash with synchrotrons, it's not enough to extract the individual spills quickly enough? Or is it just the, the dose rate from one single spill is not enough to trigger actually the flash effect? No, I say that it's possible, but it's difficult. What the, the challenge is to have a lot of, uh, let's say, 10 to the 11, 2 10 to the 11 carbon ions yes. inside the ring as a kind of a storage ring, let me put it like that. This is all of that. While instead, typically like now, we have 10 to the 9. You see? So you have to increase by factor, to a factor 100, 200, the number of okay. ions you okay. have inside, and then you extract them in a single uh, spill in a spill which is only 200 milliseconds. But you cannot extract them in a single turn because that is hundreds of microseconds. It's too short. Nobody knows what will happen if you extract in under microseconds. So you have an intermediate extraction between a fast extraction, as we call it in accelerator language, and a slow extraction. And this done in a single, so it's a challenge that nobody had before, but uh, on paper, data of, uh, with the help of Marius Sapinski, have a solution. So uh, ask a question to them because they are the expert. I'm only the talker. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, any more questions, Christoph? Not that we see in chat or Slack. Okay. So, so let me let me just take a moment. Thank you, Ugo, thank for you, accepting you for the and really taking the time to walk us through history to the future. Absolutely, really appreciate this, and I think this is a wonderful way to start this lecture course. So, thank you, and I guess we have a little coffee break now. So thank you, everybody. And we'll commence in about 12 minutes, 13 minutes. OK, thank Bye -bye you. Bye to everybody. Have a Bye -bye. good course. Thank you.